Indonesia and the experience uh, of photographing. And I will read my paper and also show you just a few examples on the slide. So, uh, introduction. In today's presentation, I will talk about some possible applications of Nishida's later thought, which uh, Wo Sun Hu um, relates to the year about 1931, uh, to the subject of photography. So, late Nishida and photography, that's my plan. I shall start by introducing my understanding of photographic images as having an essentially medial character. I will then explain why such a claim opens up a different theoretical approach to photography and also present my view as to how Nishida's concepts can be made fruitful for this claim. In this context, I shall discuss Nishida's notions of the historical world, acting intuition, from the maid to the maker, as well as some key concepts of Nishida's theory of time, such as self-determination of the eternal present and its continuous continuity. So first, I will talk about photography as a medium. So first part is photo theory, and then I will come to it. So in most cases, discussions in photo theory take as their point of departure uh, photography as an end product. That is, one aims at theorizing about photography as such, based on looking at photographic images. As Peter Geier, um, photo theorist, German photo theorist, explains, I quote, the different theories of photography are facing a challenge while they must start with photographs, they wish to take photography into account." Both ends. From this outset, the driving force of the base in photo theory had been the photography's capacity or incapacity to portray reality. It was thus claimed that photography is essentially objective, André Vazon, that it represents reality in a past state, Wallenbach. Yet, skepticism revolving around uh, such photographic realism surfaced when one started to focus one's attention on silent presuppositions of photography, such as ideological selection on the part of the photographer, criticized by the viewer, or on the technical encoding of the apparatus, uh, criticized by Wilhelm Fussel. In the first part of my PhD dissertation, my goal is to present this debate on photographic realism to polemicize the ontological status of photography. And while I cannot go in details of the matter in this presentation, I will briefly sketch out my claim, structural claim, within this debate, because I find it necessary to path the way uh, to a possible application of Nishida's philosophy to this subject. Thus, to put it briefly, photographic realism today, in my view, it is possible to reconcile the opposed views that photographic realism and its counterparts by claiming that photography has an essentially medial character. By this, I mean more specifically that photography is always found between a subject, who is making a photo, and an object, which is the photograph. Photography, somewhat paradoxically, represents a subjective view on objectivity. It is my conviction that the said structural claim, uh, while it may appear simplistic, has the potential to shed light on photography's unique ontology. The problem of whether photography represents reality cannot be solved by a mere affirmation or negation. It is rather, as I wish to argue, the shifting of focus between the subjective and the objective side of photography's mediality that can account both, both for faith and skepticism related to photographic realism. Let me give two examples to demonstrate my point. If I say, look at a surrealistic, oh, sorry, surrealistic uh, photograph, it is very likely that it will contain much of the creative figuration on the part of the subject, the photographer. The way in which the photo is composed, arranged, and potentially also manipulated, implies an artist's unique expression. It can be claimed that in this case, the subjective side of the subject-object pole in the aforementioned structure of photography as a medium is more emphasized. Yet, at the same time, some trace of the photographed reality, the objective side, for example, the chair, here, uh, will be also visible in the photo. The mere fact that this image is a photograph signifies that something from the visible reality is inscribed in the image. If, on the other hand, I take an, uh, as an example a simple photo of Paris from 1866, the objective side, as Roland Barth says, reality in a past state, uh, seems to come to the fore, seems to be emphasized. It cannot be denied that someone, in the given moment of time, took this photo and that it was realized from a certain unique perspective of which the bodily positioning of the photographer is constituted, so that the subjective element is bound to be implied in the photo, so it's not 
subjective less. Um, but, but we do not focus our attention on this particular aspect when we see such a photo. We don't say, wow, how he made this. <coughs> it's rather, ah, this is how Paris looked like. Ça a été, huh? Paris, 1866. Uh, a useful way to distinguish the visibility of the subjective and the objective uh, in the set structure of mediality of photography is to say that the subjective side represents the way in which something is represented, the how, whereas the objective side accounts for the content uh, or the objects placed before the lens, the what. And uh, André Bazin uh, plays with the, word, uh, with the word objective. He says, uh, objective, it's that which is placed before the lens, in French, objective. Mm -hmm. uh, photography's mediality, according to my hypothesis, guarantees that both aspects will be represented on a given photo, uh, but not to the same degree. Okay. Now, moving from photographic images uh, to phenomenology of photographing, or in this case, it's maybe better to say experience. So if the proposed structure of photography as a medium is deemed plausible, by which photography can be understood as something between a photographic subject and photographed objects, another field of research relevant for our understanding of photography starts to appear on the horizon. There exists namely an alternative approach to photography that in my view hasn't thus far sufficiently been taken into account by photo theorists. If you remember the quote from the beginning, uh, what Peter Geimer says is uh, you have to start with photographs. Okay? Now I suggest something else. Uh, so, at the same time, philosophers have traditionally grappled with the problem of subject-object relationship without taking photography as a philosophically relevant theme, with a few exceptions. I am convinced that precisely philosophical theories can be put to fruitful use for this alternative approach to photography that I have in mind. This approach does not start with photos as a given, uh, that is, it wants to talk about uh, photography not by having photographs as a po uh, point of departure, but rather takes a step back and examines the way the photographed objects are given to the photographing subject in the act of photographing. So my idea is to examine photography by looking at its phenomenological origin in the experience of photographing, that is to pursue its unique phenomenology. I wish to, uh, to inquire into the relevant structures of the photographic act, without which uh, there is evidently no photography. Uh, in the second part of my dissertation, I will explore the possibilities of applying Heidegger's early thinking to my project, but in this presentation, I will sketch out the main theme of the part three of my dissertation, which deals with later Nishida. So now I will talk about Nishida and photographing as self-determination of the world. In his 1939 text, Absolutely Contradictory Self-Identity, Nishida asserts that the world of reality as absolutely contradictory self-identity moves from the maid to the maker. Reality is understood here as a process of constant action in which individuals, as Nishida says, creative elements of the world, partake by making and forming things. Thus, according to Nishida, individuals are poetic. Acting, says Nishida, I quote, consists of making things. Quote X. However, being situated and always already acting in the historical world, individuals are in return formed and determined by things. This dialectical relationship between subject and object, between active and passive, which is constitutive of the movement of the historical world, is subsumed under Nishida's notion of acting intuition, koi uh, Nishida says we make according to acting intuition. Our making, our determining things, is based on intuiting the already made, which is determining us. So if there is interest in applying Nishida's thinking to a theory of the photographic act, the question arises what significant moments can be derived from such a methodology. Firstly, I believe it is possible to assert that a photographer is situated and always already acting within the historical world. Similarly, whatsoever is photographed is necessarily going to be of the said world. But according to Nishida, the subject um, is not to be understood as something opposed to the world. This means that the historical world is not only to be found on the, uh, on the side of object, so to speak, exclusively on one side of the camera. The photographer isn't just dependent on the world out there for her activity due to her embeddedness uh, in the world, but more radically, she herself and her photographic act are of the world. For Nishida, a subject represents a point of the world's perspectives. It is not just in the world, but being its part, it is constitutive element of the movement of the historical world. Therefore, photographing, described with Nishida, represents an iconic self-determination of the world. 
Self-determination, in this sense, is a possible medial concept that can describe photographing as realized between subject and object in their mutual co-determination. Now, photographing as acting intuition. This brings me to the second point, which addresses the said co-determination between subject and object. How are we to understand it within Ishida's framework? I believe that to this end, the notion of acting intuition is illuminating. Namely, a photographer is always passive in her activity, insofar as she intuits some objects that appear photographically interesting and thus determine her to make a photo. At the same time, however, in the act of photographing, the photographer actively determines objects by capturing them photographically and creating a particular photograph hmm, that maybe another photographer would photograph differently. The photographer acts upon her intuition. In other words, the photographer as a subject depends on the already made the objects, that is, she operates on, as Nishida says, the basis of the historical world, quote ends. But on the other hand, due to photographer being a perspective of the historical world, not just having a perspective, but being a perspective, her reflection of the world in the photographic act is a reflection of a unique self. Each photographer expresses the world in a singular and unique <coughs> way. Um, there is a quote of Nishida that says, there is the world of life when individuals express the world, each one in her own way. Thus, acting intuition can help explain how the concept of self-determination can include both the objective and the subjective side. So with acting intuition, I uh, more uh, clearly explain this subject-object relationship. Thus, it can serve as the sought concept of the medial encounter between a photographer and the photographed object in the act of photography. Now, no matter how uh, interesting and theoretically fruitful I find focusing on the photographic act, my aim is not to consider it in its complete isolation from the end product, from photographs. I, just, I don't want to talk about just the act. Uh, with Husserl, we may speak of a necessary correlation between noesis and noema, which applied to photographing, signifies that every, for every photo there is a correlating act that had produced it, brought it forth. Thus, as a next step, I wish to briefly approach the relation between the act and the photographic image, still within Nishida's theoretical framework. If the movement of the historical world goes from the maid to the maker, then it is possible to assert that the photographic act transforms, by means of action, the already made, or the scene, into something new, namely the photograph. It, I quote, captures the object and reduces its three-dimensionality of space and time onto the two dimensions of the photographic paper, as the Hong Kong terminologist Chung Fai Chung puts it. Therefore, the notion of acting intuition can serve not only to describe how photographers realize the subject-object mediality in the act of photographing, but it further implies that the result of action, of photographer's action, can be intuited by others, because the result of action will be a photograph. So, a uh, quote of Nishida, the result of one's own action distances itself from itself and becomes independent, quote ends. Photographers are thus Examples of, uh, of uh, photographs are thus examples of what Nishida calls public objects, which by means of visual stimulation can have an impact on others, whether it be aesthetical, ethical, or political in kind. And uh, to end, I will uh, discuss temporality of the photographic <coughs> act. So, the aforementioned detachment of the result of an action, the produced photograph, from the corresponding act of making the photo further inquires an inquiry into the temporal structure that makes both their binding and separation possible. So what's the relationship between act and product, temporally? My intention in the rest of my presentation today is to inquire into how Nishida's theory of time can help describe the said structure. So to start with, let us look at how Nishida brings the notion of self-determination in the spatial sense, of which I spoke earlier, in the sense of self-determination in the world, within a similar temporal conception. Nishida writes, now a longer quote, in the present, the past has passed and at the same time has not yet passed. Future is something which hasn't yet arrived, yet it appears already in the present. Time is established and past and future oppose each other as contradictory self-identity of the present. Therefore, time moves infinitely from past to future, from the maid to the maker, because it is contradictory self-identity. Quote X. Embedded in the historical world in which she is always already acting, a photographer acts by making a photo. The photograph is something that is already made, that is, it is coming from the past. The making, however, must take place in the present, the photographic act. The photographic act singularly and non-recurrently captures the past, 
Yet at the same time, the act makes all future referring to the photo possible. This means that while photographic images provide a testimony of a non-recurring moment past, whether it's realistic or not, we can discuss, um, the very act of photographing itself is directed towards the future. I believe that this paradoxical structure can be explained by Nishida's notion of discontinuous continuity. By preserving within the frame of a photograph something visible in the present moment, because it's a kind of a discontinuity when I snap, um, I create a possibility for every future referring to a photo. Thus, I, uh, I make uh, continuity, so to speak. Uh, be it by myself or others. Crummel speaks of the present in Nishida as, I quote, a point of decision that cuts off the past and creates the future, quote ends. Thus, in our context, the act of photographing represents also a decisive moment of the self-determination of the present. In one single shot, I have a piece of an infinite past, as Nishida says, being captured in a photograph, which in itself already extends into an infinite future of potential re referring to the photo. So it's an open end of this photo is very old, 1866, yet we can still look back at it. So there was an opening uh, in the act towards the future. Thus here too, on a temporal level, photography realizes its medial character. It not only mediates between subject and object, but also between past and future. Uh, this is to conclude the last uh, sentence. Nishida often speaks of time as something that is born and dies from moment to moment. The act of photographing too cannot but perform such a dual task. The photographer needs to kill the living moment only to give it birth in the form of a photograph, a life which can easily survive even photographers' own death. So that would be it. Thank you. The, the reality, but uh, also the way it's somehow blurred and the filter uh, means that I added something to it. So basically this is also an example of photography as a medium. Is, is this your reflection or something? In the Probably, yeah. There is yeah, there's also some reflection happening. Yeah, so obviously it would be wrong to say this is pure reality. This is exactly how reality is. Photography can never do that uh, because there will always be some way in which it was arranged. Or presented, and also the camera, of course, is the silent pres presupposition. Yeah. But also, one cannot say that this is not Nishida's table. It is. It's his table. <laughs> so. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk on um, very broad perspective. I have just something coming to my mind when listening to your talk. What distinguishes your view photography yeah. from any other mimetic devices. From any other? Mimetic devices. Uh, such as? Oh, such as whatever you like. I mean, you uh, know, paintings. Sketch, paintings, yeah. paintings, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think uh, that's why I'm focusing on photo theory as well, to make uh, unique uh, theoretical distinctions about photography. So I think photography has a unique technology. <coughs> Uh, it has a unique ontology, I would say. It is technically mediated, and also it uh, comes into being in, in one moment, which is not the case, let's say, in painting or a sketch. It has a different temporality. Uh, so I wouldn't say that, well, I would say Nishida's concepts could be applicable to, let's say, experience of painting. I wouldn't contest that. My idea is to use Nishida for describing the, for a topic that interests me, but uh, as to how photography differentiates from, let's say, painting, I would discuss it within photo theory. And then only maybe temporality could be the clue because uh, a painting cannot be just like that made, huh? and a photograph can. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe, uh, I think it's an interesting, but I also think this realism plays a role, that it's really like, uh, it's the chair that was seen I didn't imagine it, and it literally touches the lens, and it's not the same even if I look at this and then paint 
it's not going to be as direct and present. But I think this is a difficult discussion within photo theory. So yeah, thank you for this. Yeah, the, the discussion of uh, Walter Benjamin is, uh, in, theory, in photo theory, is a common. And uh, some commentators have said that uh, Walter Benjamin wouldn't have believed what has happened. That basically, photography itself became, uh, got its own aura. So for Walter Benjamin, photography is the beginning of the end of aura for, let's say, work of art. But nowadays, we look at the photograph that has an aura itself. So I think Walter Benjamin is in many ways, how to say, uh, um, we went beyond his conception. And also my problem with Walter Benjamin's look at photography is that he looks at photography only as an instrument of reproduction. And he focuses on this one thing, whereas, yeah, in this case, I don't think it makes a, such a big role that I can reproduce this. I think it's rather the interesting that I can show you Nishida's room by means of a photograph. Which, you know, that's, but okay, I, I'm not very, uh, not very interested in, in Walter Benjamin's perspective for, for those reasons. And then the second one, yeah, it sounds very plausible um, that Roland uh, Barth um, has compared haiku with photography. And I think that there is something this instantaneous uh, that is unique to Japanese thinking uh, and that is, all, that is somehow realizing photography. Maybe photographers don't reflect what they are doing, but they are doing it. They are realizing reality. And that would be a, <coughs> another possibility to, uh, um, to describe photographic act. So yeah, that, in any case, I would say. And that's why also it's a motive for me uh, to, to use uh, Nishida to describe the act. And also just the mere fact of thematizing the act, in a way, is, um, is a bit uh, Japanese, I would say. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very difficult to speak about photography in general. 
Yeah, that we could like look at certain uh, modes of project photography, certain ways of doing photography <coughs> that would be close to what Michel is describing. Uh, for example, uh, Melo Ponti uh, described uh, the paintings of Cezanne and yeah, yeah. to show how uh, his paintings show how um, this visible meaning is produced. Not they, they don't show um, the final meaning, but they show how the visible yes. field itself is kind of showing up. Yes. Um, could you, would you say that? Similar things could be uh, made with Nishida's Koitiki um, Chokman in, uh, in relation to, to photography, or yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of modes would that be? Because um, if we stay at this abstract level, yeah. then we could say anything. You yes. Know? We have to go somewhere and uh, try to think about um, concrete practices yeah. of photography. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's very good. Very good point. Um, okay. So. Uh, yeah, I must say that I am still at the beginning uh, of my PhD and what I was somehow forced to have is a clear expose and a clear idea of what I want. And so I needed to develop a certain claim and then make Nishida suitable within this framework. So it's bound to be a little more general. Huh? But I would say that this description can be made applicable to every photography, doesn't matter what practice. But uh, again, it will be more like a minimal case. It will not be as much applicable as certain practices. So I think it's a very good idea to look a bit more uh, precisely into some examples. But for example, the fact that somebody is taking a picture of something, that the subject and object and the temporal structure, even if people, even if photos are very simple, they still uh, have this kind of structure, I would argue, but it's not as interesting to look at those photos. Uh, certain photos will emphasize it more, the point that Nishida wants to make, for example. For example, one suggestion. So um, you said that Nishida sees the subjective act of taking a photograph could be seen as a self formation of the world. So yeah. Maybe you could say that um, there are certain photographers, like, for example, who don't look through the lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just walk around and they do something like this. Like yeah, yeah, like me. And so they, they are taking back their subjective uh -huh. uh, will and they let something happen. So yes, 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 yes. The process itself is yes, yes, stronger yes. than the subjective. Absolutely. Act, so. Absolutely. But I would also say, for example, I want to take a simple picture of you mm -hmm. and still you, you are not completely predictable by me. You can still move and you will still somehow co-determine this photo. So mm -hmm. I would say that on a minimal level, any kind of photo uh, is self -reported. But of course, uh, some photographers would maybe more consciously want to do that, want to realize reality in this deeper way. But I think it also depends on what kind of self we are talking about. So on the subjective side, what kind of subject do we have in mind? We have a subject, but it can also be a subject in the sense of Nishida, and it would go more in that direction. Also in the case of the subject, maybe we have to pluralize the way we think the subject. Because yes. maybe there are different modes of being subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just you know, yeah, yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and this is also great for continuing. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I really liked your paper. Thank you very much for that. Um, I had a sort of parallel set of thoughts going while you presenting it for one concept of initiatives in particular, but I was wondering if it was going to come up. So uh, maybe you know this concept. So, meter mono. Uh, so what would be the translation? Oh. Ah, yeah, 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 okay. Comes up in the Basho essay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Problems. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking this the whole time. I was wondering if you might get to it because I yeah. wondered in your account. Yeah. Uh, I guess the way I understand that, that concept is the idea that, that vision isn't focused, literally focused in the subject or in the individual. Mm -hmm. And maybe this ties into the idea of active intuition. As well, but so I'm just kind of curious if the, the mechanism, having the mechanism of the camera, yeah. if that somehow actually limits or focuses seeing yeah. to the subject in a way. So, and in that case, could it could photography, in a in a certain way, potentially work against the idea right. of this this idea of seeing or the seer? It could focus it more on the individual, whereas I think what what Nishida means by that concept is that yeah. Vision is kind of a diffuse phenomenon that yeah. isn't focused on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. That's also a very, very good remark. I think uh, 
I, my head, the reason why I haven't been talking about seeing without seer is all, again very technical reason. So a basho is middle period, right? Mm. So I was uh, limiting my focus on the later Nishida um, and early Heidegger because I didn't want that professors in Vienna said, what do you want to do with your PhD? Where's your focus? Mm. So uh, it's a bit artificial, but I think I should definitely look into it and it's very fruitful. But I would uh, still try to work uh, for Nishida, in, even in the case of photography, because I think that it's possible uh, to, to make, pho to, with, photogra with a video of photography, uh, make exactly this point visible, that it's a, see a scene without the seer. Uh, of course, then we go more in what Leon says, that it's a particular practice, mm -hmm. because obviously the, the selfie culture <coughs> would emphasize the self, right? obviously. But that's not the only possibility of photography. And that's also what I try with this mediality claim, uh, to start with something very general that's applicable and that's very flexible. And then I would obviously have to go more in depth uh, as to what can be uh, yeah, the subjective and the objective side. But yeah, thanks a lot. And can you please tell me the other <coughs> one? The Basho? Essay Basho? And the other I think one? it comes up in fundamental problems as well. Oh, no. Okay. But in the Basho essay, there's also uh, another concept that comes up about the self-seeing of the world, mm -hmm. which actually, which again, that was yeah, yeah. another concept that I had in mind that was um, sort of a parallel thought that was going on when you were doing your presentation, that there could be some interesting work to do. Because I think actually, if you go back to earlier in show, you could find ways uh, where he talks about artistic tools, not cameras, but as almost an extension of the body. So yeah. I guess it would be an interesting question to see if there's something about the mechanism of photography yeah, 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 that you can still Extend, but you could extend idea of the body to... Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I already envisioned that uh, I will have to talk about body and also thematize the, the tool. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, here in this paper, a lot of things were sort of uh, silent pre presuppositions, but that's just because uh, this is how far I've reached with <coughs> after one year. So I really want to yeah go in that direction. So thanks a lot. Thank you.